when our daughter was uh, oh, just about three years old and Janet was, uh, we were expecting Tommy, um, we took her down to the, the, sh the mall in order to, to, uh, to see Santa and to visit with Santa. And so we kind of rehearsed with her what she was going to say to Santa. And so we asked her, you know, what, what do you want for Christmas? And, and she, would, she would say, I want a book and a doll. A book and a doll. And so we kind of rehearsed that and, and kind of got her prepared to be sitting on Santa's lap because, you know, kids get afraid of, of sitting in, in somebody strange and, and uh, you know, somebody as imposing as a big fat man with a beard. And so as we went down to the mall, I was standing in a long line as, as there were other parents wanting their kids to have uh, their picture taken with Santa and, and to tell Santa what they wanted for Christmas. And, as we were standing in line, I was rehearsing with, with Kim. Now, what do you want? What are you going to tell Santa? I want a, a book and a doll. I want a book and a doll. Well, as we got closer to Santa, suddenly Kim started saying, I'm hungry, Daddy. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. What do you want from Santa? I'm hungry, Daddy. I'm hungry. Well, we finally got to Santa, and, and Kim, we got her placed up on, on Santa's lap. And Santa goes, well, what is your name, little girl? And, and she says, my name, Kim. And, and what do you want me to bring you on Christmas? Pizza! <laughs> so, that was easy that Christmas. Well, this is an anxious time of the year. It is, as we make our preparations and buying those gifts and wrapping them and getting them under the tree or mailed to the proper places of getting our, our places decorated, the cookies baked, and all of the preparations. It is a very anxious time of the year. And so, as I ask you, are, are you prepared for Christmas? I know for us, some of those things we have kind of set aside because we want to devote some time really for the preparation for the, the real Christmas. The real Christmas in the sense of, of walking the Christ child and celebrating Christ's birth. So as we prepare ourselves, my hope is that our worship services during this Advent season has been a, a time for you to prepare your, your heart. This morning, as uh, we begin, I, I want to share that from, from Philippians, Paul has a, a prescription for us. A prescription. So I, I'm not a doctor, Tim. I don't, I don't want anybody to think that I, I'm a doctor, but um, Paul gives us a prescription for, for that the thing that we, we long for, and that is that longing joy and that, and that, and that quiet peace. And so I'd like to, to read to you um, from the fourth chapter of, of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord always. The first part of the prescription that, that, that Paul gives us is, is to rejoice in the Lord always. Now, when he's talking about rejoice or, or joy, for us it is, it is not that joy of of finding everything we want under the tree, or that everything goes just the way we have planned. Because if we look at Paul's life, if we look at Paul's life, we get the understanding that there are no guarantees in life, and, and just because we claim Christ as our Savior has no free will pass on to, on to go and collect $200, and we escape all of paying the rent and all of going to jail and all of that. We know that life has its ups and downs. And if we just look at Paul's life, we realize in itself, how could he rejoice? How could he rejoice when you consider all that he had been through? You see, when he was writing to the Philippians, he was actually writing from death row. He was sitting in prison, writing and, and, and writing to those he loved, sending his last thoughts and his, his last memories and, and words of encouragement to those who were just beginning as a Christian church. Can you imagine sitting on death row, knowing that your death was imminent, and knowing that the Romans would have a way of, of, of doing you in, and just because, 
Just because Paul was a Roman citizen, he was not given a crucifixion, a cross to die upon. His, his head was literally separated from the rest of his body. So what he had to look forward to was not really much. And if you look at the rest of his life, if you read through his story, he himself went through three shipwrecks. Five times he was, he was stoned, and I don't mean going to Colorado and getting high. <laughs> Literally, by, by rocks. A number of times that he was the focus of riots and, and death threats in his life, run out of town. Five times he was whipped to, to a very inch of his life. And then another time he had that close walk with death when a snake bit him, a poisonous snake. So we know that, that Paul did not exactly have it easy, and yet as he's writing this letter in prison, he's talking about rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. How can we find that, that thought of, of joy in our lives? For some, Christmas is not really the easiest time of the year. For those who grieve, I, I know the sadness that comes in this time of year when there are places at the table that are no longer filled. When all of the celebrations revolve around family, and someone very special is not there. I know what that feels like, and it's especially hard when everybody is so jolly. But that is the gift that we have, and that's why Paul is able to rejoice. That even in the struggles of life, and even as he is standing on death's doorway, he knows the strength and the power that comes in knowing that Christ is with him. That is the joy that, that Paul is talking about. As he said, rejoice in the Lord always because the Lord is near. To know that even in the struggles of life and the hardships of life, we know that God is always there for us. And that is what we celebrate at Christmas. Rejoice in the Lord always. Because I know that God is always there with us. Secondly, Paul is a prescription gives to us put on gentleness. Now, gentleness is not a word I think that you would use at this Christmas season. Any of you were watching the news on, on Black Friday and, and watched as the, as the people were avalanching through, the, the customers were avalanching through the stores and, and running each other over and fighting over Christmas bargains and, and having slugfests over who would get the last of the big screen TVs. It's crazy nuts out there, isn't it? Not exactly what you would call a time to be gentle. But it is one of the things that we have to offer as Christians in the midst of this crazy, crazy time of the year. And that is our our gentleness. To offer gentleness in the sense of that brings that peace and, and joy even in the moment. Let me tell you a story about gentleness. It just was on the news. You know all of the tension that's going on in Israel between the Palestinians and, and the and, and the Israels and the Jewish people. And the Israelite Israel um, soldier was out to, out amongst the Palestinians where he was 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 uh, was guarding and, and walking through the, the streets. And as he's walking through the streets, suddenly he felt himself pelted with rocks. He grabbed his rifle and turned around quickly. And, and, and as he looked around, they were just children who were throwing rocks. And then in that moment, he had to decide: Do I shoot, or what do I do? What do I do? The rocks did not stop coming as he tried to figure out what he was going to do. And as we know, in this day and age, things 
move very quickly as people are more quickly to shoot than they are to think. But the soldier then put his gun away and reached down and he picked up three rocks and he started juggling. And as he was juggling, the kids dropped their rocks and they began watching. Before long, he added a couple of tricks and then he had a great uh, fanfare of an ending and he took a bow. And the kids applauded and they were laughing as he turned and, and walked his way. He turned a, a tense moment that could have been really eye, um, heartbreaking for families who would have lost their children and used gentleness as a way of bringing peace at the moment and brought a smile to these children. Gentleness. It is a way of, of extending that peace that is beyond our understanding. On Thursday, the UMW had a, a, their, their Christmas dinner, and we had a, a wonderful time. And following that dinner, we here at our church hosted the Iman from the Israel Center, the Jewish rabbi from, from the Sons of Jacob, and several area clergy who gathered around the table. And as we were gathered together as representatives from the, the Cedar Valley uh, Interfaith Coalition, as well as the, the Cedar Falls Ministerial Association, what do we do about the hate language towards our brothers and sisters who are Muslims? What do we do? And so we put together a, a letter in which we, we sent, and it was already published in the paper, it was in the paper already, in the back page, and I encourage you to read through it. But in that time together with Amon from the Israel Center, he, he in, his, in his attempt to speak his English as best as he could, talked about how sorry he was and apologized for all that had happened, but he and his religion did not believe in that. And he himself does not understand it himself and could not explain why those who do this in the name of Islam would harm innocence in our world and around the world. In tears in his eyes, he said he's sorry. It was a very powerful moment and something that I'm very proud of that we were able to host this opportunity as, as we are going to seek to build those relationships with the Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians in the Cedar Valley area. You see, that happens when we are gentle as, afraid, as opposed to using words of hate and allowing our anger to take over. Next, Paul, as a prescription, gives to us, in all things, pray. Pray to God with thanksgiving that we might have that peace that is beyond our understanding. One of the things I was so glad that Ralph was able to share this morning is that Jen and I made a practice of reading to our children night at night before they went to bed. It became such a ritual that, that it, was, it was, you just never had to fight with the kids. They, they loved, and, and uh, I loved it especially when all three of them could nestle in my lazy boy chair and I could read to them. And no matter how anxious they were, no matter what was going on in their lives or what was happening within our family, that time of reading for them seemed to calm them down, to bring a peace about them that they were able to then go to sleep. Just as I'm able to put most of you to sleep on Sunday mornings, you, I had this wonderful way of doing that to our children as we read. But as we, we think about the world that our children live in, the anxiousness that they hold, the fear that they have, the concerns that they carry with them to school are much different than what I carry to school as a child. And what we're proposing is to change their lives 
by offering them books that our hope is that maybe a parent or a, a role model would read to them and maybe for five minutes they would have that, that assurance and that comfort and that strength that they are loved. That's how we change a child's story. And that's how we make a difference in the world. So Thursday, I, I challenged our UMW. The leadership was lined up here and I gave them all quarters. They talked about that we don't get change anymore when we go to the grocery store or to the store. We use our debit cards or we write checks, but rarely do we get changed. And when, when we get changed, the people don't even know how to count it back. I mean, what kind of world is this? And what I hate most is that they will give me my dollar bills there and then they'll lay the change on top of it. And I've got my hand with something else and I'm trying to juggle the change. What am I gonna do with that change on top of that? But I used to put all the change in my pocket and then carry it home and I have a dish uh, at my bedside that I throw the change in and then I use it for, for projects, like, like the Heffel Project. It's amazing how that change grows. But we are, as a church, are called to change the world. To change the world. So I gave our UMW quarters as a symbolism of the change that we are going to make and sometimes it doesn't take very much to make a difference. And so I challenge them, and I'm going to challenge you too. Ralph says there's 13 who read over at Lincoln School. In 2016, I would like to see that number doubled. I'd like to see 26 of us over there who are reading to the children, because five minutes could make a difference and change a child's life. And if you don't have time to do that, throw a quarter in because each quarter will add up to buy a book that could change a child's story. You see, there was a child that was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago that changed the world and made a difference in you and I. And so let us change the world and make a difference in the life of a child. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for all that you've given to us. And you have given to us much compared to all that this world has to deal with. And so, Lord, may we respond with gentleness. May we rejoice even in the hard times. And may we seek to change, to change the world in bringing your peace that is beyond our understanding. May it be so. In the name of Jesus, amen.